Hi, everybody. I want to use Gauss's law to find the E field inside a sphere and outside a sphere. So it's going to be a sphere that has a constant charge throughout it, or a uniform charge. That's the word I'm looking for, a uniform charge. So this, if this were a conductor, by the way, the charge would end up having to be on the outside of this sphere. Uh, you'll find, and I'll get into this uh, you know, in more detail, but once you get below the surface, the E field's actually zero, uh, or more importantly, there's no charge contained. There can be, there can be scenarios where you have an E field uh, even though the, there's no charge. Uh, but that's what I'm talking about here is a uh, non-conducting sphere that somehow or another, so it's like an insulating sphere that's gotten a charge distributed all the way through it. And that charge, let's think of it as a density, so rho, uh, we use lambda for a linear charge density, we use sigma for a uh, surface charge density, and this is a volume charge density, so that's the total charge divided by the total volume which that's going to be true in uh, A, you've got the entire uh, charge divided by the entire volume, and B, when we're actually looking at an area less than the, uh, the radius of the sphere, so little r is actually less than big R, it's actually still going to work. Okay, in fact, I'm going to call that Q enclosed, that's what that stands for, divided by that smaller volume, V small. Let's call it VV. BB. So we can actually, you know, use it in both scenarios. But uh, first, let's use Gauss's law for A. So Gauss's law says the closed interval of E field dotted with the area vector dA, the uh, uh, differential area vector dA, is equal to the total charge enclosed by that particular surface over here. That's what the circle around the interval means, surface area divided by epsilon naught, which is the uh, electric constant. Well, this is one of those scenarios where we can use symmetry to our benefit. If we draw a Gaussian sphere like you see in A that surrounds this charged sphere, the E field is going to be for every sphere that is concentric with the sphere that's charged, so this guy and then a bigger one, a bigger one, a bigger one, the, as long as they uh, are symmetrically placed, the E field is going to be constant everywhere on this blue line here. Every The surface of that sphere that would surround the charged sphere here would have constant E field. So that means all I need to know, the E field that I'm looking for at that particular point is going to be, well if you multiply that by the air surface area of the sphere for that particular size, 4 pi r squared, that's Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So as long as, so scenario A little r that we're, our Gaussian surface is radius is little r in both circumstances. In the circumstance where that's actually greater than the size of the sphere we're curious about, well then the E field ends up being 1 over 4 pi r squared times Q enclosed. In fact, the Q enclosed in this case is just capital Q, the entire charge, uh, divided by epsilon naught. And if we rewrite this a little bit, what you see is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is k, so then you end up with k q over r squared. So this isn't all that surprising, but Gauss's law actually let us arrive at the point charge formation for uh, formulation for E field. Well, that's good. So it, it works, in other words. So let's try it in the more complicated scenario, B. The radius of our Gaussian sphere is less than the radius of the sphere. So not all of the charge is included. So you can imagine a sphere down inside, this little dashed line sphere uh, down inside only part of the orange sphere. So only part of the charge is now in there. Well, we have a way to do that. It turns out that Q enclosed over epsilon naught is actually equal to the... So this was E for scenario A. So this is E for scenario... Wow, I butchered my E there. E for scenario B times 4 pi r squared. Exact same formulation. It's We're still saying that the uh, E field everywhere on this sphere with the dashed line that's smaller than I drew on it, didn't I? 
this guy's uh, surface area still has a constant E field everywhere on it. So whatever that, that dash line sphere is, same E field. So that means, since that's true, since the E field's constant, I can still just do uh, Gauss's law by saying it's E field times the surface area of that Gaussian sphere equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Remember up here that Q enclosed over the volume in this scenario is still equal to rho. So I have a way to relate the uh, two scenarios. So it actually will work out just fine. So let's go. Now I've got Q enclosed. So the, the trick here is that I don't necessarily know what rho is, but I know that, so this, I don't know this value, but I know it relates these guys. Uh, in fact, I want to say that um, Q over, so rho equals Q over four thirds pi big R cubed. Uh, this is all of the charge over all of the volume, 4 thirds pi r cubed being the formula for volume. And in the second scenario, where I've just got some of it enclosed, but not all of it, it's q enclosed over 4 thirds pi little r cubed. Remember, this is the r cubed in scenario b. And over here, we're saying that on the, for the entire orange sphere, it's got a charge Q and a volume 4 thirds pi r cubed. Well, if rho is a constant, then these two guys are equal to each other. And if that's true, then the 4 thirds pi drops out of this expression. And I can formulate this a little bit differently. And I can say that Q times the Gaussian surface radius cubed divided by the actual uh, radius of the thing cubed is Q enclosed. So I can actually put, I can now relate these guys together. So that means, so this is Q enclosed. So now I've got big Q times R cubed over big R cubed times one over epsilon naught. Let's not forget that. So there's my Q, there's my epsilon naught equals the E field of point B, which is what we're actually looking for, times four pi R squared. And if we rearrange this stuff a little bit, so wait, we've got an r squared over here, and then the, which makes this an r over there, and there's four pi and an epsilon naught. So I'm gonna divide both sides by four pi, and this entire expression becomes one over four pi epsilon naught, which is k. So e at point b is k times the total charge q over r cubed times little r. Remember, this is the radius of our Gaussian sphere that's smaller than the radius of the orange uh, sphere that's charged Q. This is the radius of that sphere and here's the total charge on it. And so I mean what we found here is that we've still got a, a KQ but instead and notice that the units actually work. R cubed on the bottom, R on the top so it's still uh, gonna end up with KQ or R squared in terms of units but if the, the Gaussian surface is less than like we've got up here this guy's actually less than the radius of our charged uh, sphere even though it's remember though if this were a conducting sphere all the charge would have to be on the surface so this has to be some sort of insulating sphere that still has a charge embedded in it somehow and now we've got a way to figure out what that is using Gauss's law and um, one more thing about this if we were going to graph so hang on if we had E field on the y-axis and a distance away from the center of the sphere on this axis so this is E field, and this is, let's call it little r. So for a whole bunch of different Gaussian surfaces. So wait, this point right here, that's going to be big R. And so what you'll see is that there's, when there's no charge enclosed at the very center of the sphere, there's no E field, and it'll go up constantly like this. So it's a constant value. So look, this is a constant, this is a constant, this is a constant. All of this stuff right here. This is linear. So we've got constant times linear. So we have a line from the origin up to this point, and then it'll start to die off as 1 over r squared, which sort of looks like that. So this would be EB, and this would be EA. Notice, that's so bad. Notice that there's this discontinuity right here. We actually don't have a very good way to describe the E field right at that point. Uh, we could, well, you'll notice though, regard, there are ways to model it and it doesn't have to get 
quantum mechanics y, but you, that there is a cusp point right there. So that is to be expected. So inside the sphere, as you contain more and more and more charge, you go the E field goes linearly up, and then it starts to die off as one over R squared. It becomes an inverse square law. So uh, yeah, that's a pretty good uh, rundown on that.